Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. It's such a great honor for me and a pleasure to join you today as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of what I consider to be Nigeria's premier newspaper, and indeed one of Africa's finest newspapers, The Guardian. This milestone not only marks four decades of journalistic excellence, it also symbolizes the enduring power of the press in shaping societies and fostering an informed citizenry. The Guardian has done that and more in Nigeria over the past 40 years. Four decades ago, as a young man finding my way, I remember picking up a copy of The Guardian for the very first time in 1983 for the princely price of 20 kobo at a time. There was something special about the publication that immediately lit up Nigeria's media scene. The Guardian was exceptionally well written and researched. It brought together some of the finest writers that you can think of. An editorial staff that was incredible, including Stanley Masebo, Jemi Ogubi, Suli Abu, Lade Banola, Olatunji Dare, Omar Ogun, Odien Efremnum, Edwin Madunago, and several others. Their journalistic brilliance and prose made The Guardian the undisputed news publication of the era. Ever since, The Guardian has been a steadfast beacon of truth, a guardian of democracy, and a mirror reflecting the myriad facets of our society. Its motto, conscience nurtured by truth, is apt. It was then, it is now, and it will be for the years to come. Yeah. That's because without truth and without conscience, no foundation, no nation, no society or institution can stand. Over the years, this world-class publication has set a benchmark for journalistic excellence. It has helped to shape public discourse, champion accountability, and serve as the people's watchdog. In doing so, The Guardian has justifiably earned the respect of Nigerians and readers all across the world. Today, as we commemorate this significant anniversary, we laud the newspaper's unwavering commitment to the principles of free speech, transparency, and the pursuit of truth. We also salute the pioneer publishing spirit, of the late Alex Ibro, the courage of the Ibro family, and successive publishers, the generations of Guardian journalists, many of you are, them are here today, who have upheld the principles of editorial independence and freedom of expression, even during the darkest and the most oppressive years of military rule. True to his name, the Guardian has remained a guardian of truth. In this age of globalization and interconnectedness, the role of the media extends beyond national borders. I was glad when Lady Medin Ibru was talking about, and also her daughter when they were talking about the importance that you attach to issues beyond Nigeria in terms of projecting the image of Africa. The Guardian has therefore also been a voice for Africa, as it should, sharing stories that resonate across the continent and beyond. Of course, in 2021, I was very humbled when The Guardian, in his collective wisdom, graciously honored me as the man of the year. It was pretty cool, actually. <laughs> and in that edition, I picked it up, and there was a caricature thing of me. Uh, it had a nice photo, and he had me with my on the front cover with my bow tie with it, which I really like, thank you for doing that. <laughs> and with a caption, man of the year, proudly Nigerian and proudly African. I thank God God made me a Nigerian, I always will be grateful for that. <laughs> thank you so much for such a great honor. It is one I will always cherish. So congratulations, Lady Made in Hebrew and the Hebrew family and all of you on your 40th anniversary. Let me now turn to the theme that I've been asked to speak about today. And that is, for the world to respect Africa. Now the first thing that I want to underline is that respect 
is never a given. It cannot be purchased. It must be earned. And it is earned based not on rhetoric or request, but based on action, concrete action, consistent action over time. As a leader, my way of making decisions is actually pretty simple. No econometric analysis going with it. I simply write down the things that make me ashamed, and I do the opposite. We must take a critical look around us. The underdevelopment, the poverty in the midst of plenty, and the fact that we are far behind other regions of the world, despite our enormous resources, and determine that enough is enough. Poverty must not become the comparative advantage of Africa. Nearly half of the world's gold and one third of all the minerals are in Africa. With its vast mineral resources and human resource capacity, Africa should not be where it is today. Nigeria and many other African nations were once at the same level of development as some East Asian countries, notably Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea, and several others. We must really ask ourselves, when will we make the shift that South Korea made from being a country that was one on the low end of the development ladder to a rich, industrialized nation that it is today. There was a period during which some East Asian countries like South Korea struggled to actually obtain World Bank loans. And I remember this because my friend who was then the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, told me about it because he's from South Korea. It was very difficult for them to actually qualify to have a World Bank loan. And that was a concessional loan at the time. Today, South Korea is the seventh largest exporter of goods in the world. Not only that, its GDP per capita towers at 266% of the global average. We must therefore find solutions to our many challenges in Africa. While we must deal with the bread and butter development issues, we must think strategically as we set ourselves upon a path of also becoming wealthy nations. Our countries must become great contributors to global wealth and development financing for others. We simply must turn the tide. Ultimately, we must put ourselves in a position where too we also can give. That is how Africa will earn respect. Let me start with poverty on the continent. Africa has some 431 million out of the continent's 1.4 billion people living in extreme poverty. A number that has increased with an additional 84 million people since the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. South Asia and East Asia and the Pacific had roughly 50% and two-thirds of their population living in extreme poverty in 1990. And they saw a significant decline to 9% and 1% respectively by 2019. Sub-Saharan Africa, which had 50% of its population in extreme poverty in 1990, just like it was in South Asia, only saw a decline to 35% by 2019. It is therefore time for poverty accountability for governments. Africa will not earn respect globally until we end poverty at scale. Now, for too long, and way too long, we have allowed poverty to linger pervasively in the midst of plenty. Our nations are resource rich, and yet the majority of our citizens remain poor, in most cases, dirt poor. We often tend to accept poverty as normal. Let me be unequivocally very clear. Poverty is not normal. It is abnormal, especially when we have so much resources and when it has been pervasive for so long. And that is why I believe Africa should not become a museum of poverty. 
To reverse this trend, we must make, have public accountability on poverty. Our governments must realize that it is their responsibility to lift all their people out of poverty and into wealth as fast as possible. And of course, it is doable. We have seen clear examples of such progress in other regions of the world, especially in Asia, over the past three decades. There is no reason why acute poverty cannot be eradicated in Nigeria and across Africa. We have to become a continent that grows inclusive and well-distributed wealth. By tackling poverty, I do not mean the so-called poverty alleviation, because that is a term that I reject in its entirety. We cannot be comfortable with poverty. If you are sick from malaria and you visit with your doctor who says, I will alleviate your malaria. Please get out and look for a better doctor. I do not believe in poverty alleviation. If someone moves from $1.30 per day to $1.50 per day, and they move to $1.60 per day, they are still poor. They are still extremely poor. I had a conversation with my good friend, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, when we were on the Millennium uh, uh, Development Goals, together then with the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And I said, if we are measuring poverty based on the convenience of the rich, then it looks as if everything is improving, when in fact it is not improving. You walk into McDonald's and try to buy a hamburger for one dollar, you can't. For one dollar sixty, you can't. And so why are we measuring poverty, that people are out of poverty, just because they are earning $2 a day? It cannot buy you a hamburger. Let's get serious about this particular issue. We must therefore eliminate poverty and create wealth, and do so fast. To protest my point, let's look at the following. South Korea moved the GDP per capita. That was $350 in 1960s when it got independence to approximately $33,000 in 2023. But that's the kind of quantum leap that we need rather than attempt to be saying we are dealing with alleviating poverty. When we rapidly take our people out of poverty, we will begin to earn the respect that we deserve. Saudi Arabia has oil, as does Nigeria. Kuwait has oil as does Nigeria. Qatar has abundant gas, as does Nigeria and other countries. Yet Nigeria is the country with the largest share of its population living below extreme poverty line in 2023 in Africa. That is not a gold medal that we should be proud about. Clearly, there is something fundamentally wrong in our management, or rather mismanagement of our natural resources. It is also clear that if we continue to mismanage these natural resources, we will remain stuck. When we look at a pervasive state capture in several instances of oil and gas, minerals and metals, it is abundantly clear that there is no transparency or very little of it in and of course on accountability for how we manage these abundant resources. Consequently, in the midst of plenty, Majority of the people remain poor. I have urged African governments to stop securing loans backed by their natural resources. And that's because those natural resource backed loans are not transparent. They are expensive. They make debt resolution very, very difficult. If that trend continues, it will be a disaster for Africa. Now, some speak about natural resource curse. They say that if you have natural resources, somehow you are going to be on a trajectory where you are going to be poor. I don't think the issue is the natural resources, that is the natural resource curse. I think it's a curse of leadership. It's a lack of leadership. How can it be that what's supposed to make you rich makes you poor? I don't buy this. The so-called natural resource curse has not applied to Saudi Arabia. It has not been relevant to Qatar nor to Norway, 
I was there recently on a panel with their minister of international development talking about $1.3 trillion of assets under management that they have from their own resources, which is the same oil that we have. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are all nations that are rich in natural resources that have served them very well. Now, why should it be different for Africa's natural resource rich countries? It all comes down to governance, transparency, accountability, and sound management of our natural resources. If we manage our natural resources well, Africa has no reason to be poor. We have $6.2 trillion of natural resources. So how in the world are we poor? We simply need to pull up our socks, stamp our corruption, and manage our natural resources in the interest of our countries and in the interest of our people. And let me say, the resources of a country does not belong in the pockets of powerful and rich individuals. It belongs for the state to be used for the, for the benefit of the people of that country. There must be accountability on our natural resources. I wonder sometimes when people go around and say, well, I've actually helped. We put a borehole in our state, or pull a borehole, and it's on national television. The very fact that you're actually installing boreholes is an indication of government failure. Because in 21st century, every single house must be having pipe bomb water. So there's nothing to be really delightful about in trying to do that. And we should get away from this feeling of leaders feeling that they are doing public good. No. Leaders must be held accountable for the resources of the people. <laughs> Africa will gain respect when it is able to feed itself. Any nation or region that begs for food is free only in words, but dependent on others for life. Feeding 9.5 billion people in the world by 2050 will be a big challenge. Given climate change and a limited amount of cultivated arable land left in the world in many countries, Africa will play a critical role in this. And that's because Africa has 65% of the remaining uncultivated arable land in the world. And that means that what Africa does with agriculture will determine the future of food in the world. Now, but despite this, Africa has not been able to feed itself. Africa's food import bill hit $85 billion in 2021. It's expected to surpass $110 billion by 2025, with 283 million Africans going to bed every day hungry. Now, we are changing this narrative. Of course, when you've got a president of the African Development Bank coming with an agriculture background, what do you expect? The African Development Bank has invested over $8 billion in agriculture over the past seven years, which has improved the food security for 250 million people. When the Russian-Ukraine war broke out and disrupted wheat and maize exports, Africa faced a potential food crisis. I said, and many of you may remember when I was Minister of Agriculture here, I said at that time in 20. Uh, 12, when we had a, a, a really disastrous flood. Uh, Dr. Abati will remember my statement at the time. I said, we will not have a food crisis. And we didn't have a food crisis. We managed it well. In fact, we did the nation's first dry season famine program, which produced so much food like you've never seen before. And by March of the next year, we had produced so much food that the price of food collapsed. Inflation went down. And so I said the same thing when we had this potential food crisis from Russia and Ukraine war. I said Africa will not see a food crisis. And that Africa should not go around begging for food or pleading with Russia to give it more food, but rather get bowls in its hand, put his own seed in those bowls, and plant those seeds for itself to grow the food with pride for itself. The African Development Bank rapidly approved $1.5 billion emergency food production facility for African countries. Today, this facility is supporting 20 million farmers in 36 countries to produce 38 million metric tons of food valued at $12 billion. Now, just for your information, the total amount that we will lose, we stood to lose from Russia invasion in Ukraine for the imports 
was 30 million metric tons of food. And that 8 million metric tons, more than that, 30 million metric tons of food that I'm talking about. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Africa did not beg. Africa produced more food, and Africa gained respect. Our support to Ethiopia help it now to achieve self-sufficiency in wheat within just four years, turning it into a wheat exporting country. And we started here in Nigeria already in this dry season. There's absolutely no reason why Nigeria should not be a net exporter of wheat. To replicate this global success, the African Development Bank helped to organize this year in January myself and President Marcus Sall of Senegal, a Feed Africa Summit which attracted 34 heads of state and government. Our leaders didn't just simply come there to speak. They committed to driving self-sufficiency and food sovereignty. I want to emphasize food sovereignty. Every time you need food, your neighbor may love you to death. But it's not your neighbor's responsibility to feed you. And any responsible father or mother, when it's time for dinner, can all just say, or just go to your neighbor's house. No, we must have pride and be able to feed ourselves. I'm glad to report that this landmark summit, we've been able to mobilize globally $72 billion to help Africa achieve these targets. <laughs> but even as we do this, we must do more than simply produce more food and agricultural commodities. Take, for example, that Africa, which accounts for only 65% of the production of cocoa, only receives 2% of the total of $120 billion worth of global value of chocolates. Now, what's the brain surgery, you tell me, in making chocolates? When Africa, while African farmers language in poverty, chocolate processors smile all the way to the bank. One is condemned to penury. The others create wealth. The same can be said for cotton, tea, coffee, cashew, and other raw commodities that Africa exports at a significant loss in terms of revenue and jobs. Now, let me be very clear on two issues. The export of raw commodities is the door to poverty. The export of value-added products is a highway to wealth. <laughs> to gain respect, Africa must turn itself into a global powerhouse in food and agriculture. And that's why the African Development Bank and its partners have provided $1.6 billion for the development of what we call special agro-industrial processing zones. In fact, right here in Nigeria, we have put in place the same program in eight states that are now being funded by the bank Islamic Development Bank, and also International Fund for Agricultural Development, with more than almost um, $620 million devoted to Nigeria. And I received requests now to do this in 24 more zone, 25 more zones in Nigeria. And just to break down the technicality on this, what exactly do they mean? You go to rural areas today, there are zones of economic misery. There are nothing there. Infrastructure is concentrated in the urban areas. And yet, we say majority of our people are in rural areas. The only way we are going to be able to get them out of poverty is if we turn the main business in which their lives depend into a real wealth creating sector. And that cannot happen unless we have consolidated infrastructure and logistics that's going to make agriculture not only productive, efficient, competitive, money-making business that will drive all those people out of, wealth, out of poverty into wealth. So these new zones are zones where we are going to put in roads, water, irrigation, storage, infrastructure, processing facilities, so that food and our companies can locate there and bring new life there. If you are a minister of finance, listen to me what I'm saying today. Africa must go beyond the fiscal transfers of resources to rural areas. Africa must expand the fiscal space in its rural areas by turning those areas from zones of economic misery into zones of economic prosperity. And that can only happen through this kind of structural transformation. 
And I was delighted that at the Africa Investment Forum, which we had two weeks ago, that we launched a $3 billion alliance for special agro-industrial processing zones that will continue to do this in several countries. Africa's countries, African countries, must turn the sweat of their farmers into wealth. Africa will gain respect when it takes advantage of its vast natural resources to develop its economies and transform the lives of its people. What applies to agriculture also applies to Africa's minerals, oil, gas, and metals, such as copper, cobalt, manganese, graphite, and lithium. Africa accounts for 70% of the global reserves of, lit of platinum, 52% of cobalt, 48% of manganese. If you take the DRC alone, Democratic Republic of Congo, it accounts for 70% of the global supply of cobalt. But listen to this. China accounts for the highest percentage of refining of these strategic minerals. Cobalt, 73%. Nickel, 68%. Lithium, 59%. Copper, 40%. So as the world transitions into renewable energy sources, Africa has the largest source of renewable energy in the world. That renewable energy revolution will depend on these critical minerals for the manufacturing of wind turbines, solar panels, battery energy storage systems, and electric vehicles. There is so much money to be made because the size of the electric vehicles market is estimated to rise from $7 trillion today. And between now and 2030, if you combine that with the battery energy systems, storage system, it will be $8 trillion. And that will rise to $57 trillion by 2050. That's going to be a 500% increase in demand for cobalt, graphite, and lithium by 2025. Therefore, Africa must strategically position itself in this rapidly growing global battery storage and electric vehicle value chains. We did a study we supported from the bank to look at the manufacturing of lithium ion precursor batteries in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we tried to compare that with China and Poland. And we found that if you were producing that in Democratic Republic of Congo, you, it would be three times cheaper the manufacturing in China, United States, or in Poland. And therefore, Africa must develop these value chains in order to process, add value, and become well integrated into global supply chains. Of course, we must not forget there are real geopolitical issues and interests that drive international engagements on these critical metals. But Africa should strategically position itself to build its own industrial manufacturing capacities with infrastructure, with skills, with knowledge, with competencies, and investment partnerships. Africa's green metals must become Africa's green wealth. Africa will gain respect when it becomes an important player in global manufacturing. Today, Africa accounts for just 3% of the global manufacturing. Industrializing is the fastest way to wealth. And here, once again, permit me to focus on my home country, Nigeria especially. Nigeria must unleash an industrial revolution on this continent. The day Nigeria wakes up and becomes a Lion King like you had in the Lion, in, in, in the Lion King movie, everything will change for its people and everything will change for all of Africa. Malaysia and Vietnam have used aggressive horizontal and vertical diversification of industrial production to move from low value to high value market products. The result is reflected in their wealth status. Malaysia's export value per capita is $7,100. For Vietnam, $3,100. For Nigeria, $100 and $60. So while Malaysia and Vietnam 
have long moved into global manufacturing growth. They are creating explosive wealth and jobs for themselves. Nigeria, meanwhile, has remained in a survival mode. Sadly, Nigeria is still unable to replace its imports of petroleum products, thereby being one of the largest exporters of crude oil in the world. For now, Nigeria is developing way too slowly and far below its potential. I am very hopeful that the current administration, under His Excellency President Bola Ben Tinumbu, and I have followed a lot of the statements being made by the government, I am quite hopeful that it will help to revive Nigeria's manufacturing sector. And I'm here, I'm, there, I'm glad that the special representative, the president, is here. It's very, very important. Industrial manufacturing is the way we are going to pull ourselves out of this morass of poverty that should never be in this country. Now, everything that I've said so far about Africa coming into its own and reaching its full potential is undermined by a very strong manufacturing base. To get there, we must implement the right policies, make the right investments, get our infrastructure in order, improve logistics and financing frameworks. We must make sure that this is driven by a highly skilled and competent youthful workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, excellences, Africa will gain respect when its voice is heard and respected as the world grapples with the greatest threat to human existence, that is climate change. Next week, the whole of the world will descend in the United Arab Emirates for COP28. The annual meeting of the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In fact, as soon as I finish this lecture, I'll be on my way to the airport to be on my way to that event. I came specifically just to honor you here on my way out there. So I can add my voice to Africa's call. Climate change is devastating many parts of Africa. Drought and diversification across the Sahel, desertification across the Sahel. And in the Horn of Africa, cyclones in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Madagascar have had devastating effects. Africa, which accounts for only 3% of global emissions, now bears the disproportionate consequence of it. Nine out of the 10 most vulnerable countries of climate change are in Africa. Africa loses seven to $15 billion a year to climate change, and if that continues, it's going to reach roughly almost $50 billion a year by 2030. Now, there's always a debate about the growth trajectory of nations. Now, while the developed countries grew very well, they created massive wealth, they did so with huge amount of externalities globally, which they did not internalize. Their living standards went way up, but at the cost of the environment, because they simply used up 85% of the global carbon budget, was used up by the developed countries. Africa's emissions are dwarfed by the emissions of other continents. Let me put that in perspective for you. If you're an American or an Australian, the amount of carbon that they actually emit per month is the same as an African emits for the whole year. And in many places, the amount of electricity used by a refrigerator in America or in other developed countries, is more than an African will use for the whole of the year. But when we look at the global financing for climate change, I believe it is shortchanging. Senator, how are you? <laughs> it's shortchanging Africa, providing only $29 billion out of the $653 billion in climate financing globally. To give voice to Africa's needs, the African Development Bank launched $25 billion Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program to deliver greater financing for Africa to adapt to climate change. In fact, as I'm going to UAE, we'll be launching a $1 billion climate risk insurance facility for adaptation that will allow us to ensure African countries 
against extreme weather patterns, be it droughts, be it floods, be it cyclones, so that we don't have to constantly go through the vicissitudes of these things when they happen. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, Africa will gain respect when it can provide universal electricity access to all of its people and drop the gap of being known as the dark continent. Africa, after all, has the largest renewable potential in the world, including solar, hydro, wind, and geothermal. The problem, of course, is we have 600 million Africans today that have no access to electricity. And we have 900 million Africans that cannot even afford decent cooking. We lose today 300,000 women every year. And what are they trying to do? Simply cook a decent meal for their families. 300,000 kids on their back lose their lives just because of secondary smoke they get from this particular situation. This cannot continue. And so I think we need to really look at this and say the global energy transition must recognize the realities of Africa. There has been a lot of underinvestment in Africa in energy. We get only 3%. Of the $3 trillion that have gone into renewable energy global investments, only 3% over the last two decades. And therefore, when it comes to renewable energy, Africa accounts for only 3% of the jobs being created by that globally. In my view, that is unfair, that is unjust, and that is unacceptable. And that's why when I became president, when I was elected president first time in 2015, I launched what is called New Deal on Energy for Africa to push so that we can get universal access to electricity. It's a hard work. But I'm glad to let you know that since that time, the average access, average across Africa, has moved from 32% to 57%. Now, there are some countries that are making remarkable progress. Ethiopia, Kenya, and if you go, for example, Morocco. In Morocco, the African Development Bank supported Morocco. Today in Morocco, they have 98% of all their rural areas have, they have 100% electrification rate. The African Development Bank, therefore, is at the forefront of unlocking Africa's renewable energy potential. We helped to finance in Morocco what's called New Wazazate. That's the largest concentrated solar power plant in the world. If you go to Kenya, you see the Lake Tukana project there. That's the largest wind power mill, power station in Africa. And right here in Nigeria, We've invested $210 million to develop the transmission lines. We are going to be supporting the state of Jigawa to develop 1,000 megawatts of solar power, which will be very big for this country. I have the governor of Lagos State, you hear, Governor Sawolu and I had a discussion in which the bank committed to supporting Lagos State to have the first public-private partnership transmission line in this country, and that's going to be right here in Lagos State. We are doing more than that. I did my master's thesis and PhD thesis when I was in the United States, living in Maradi in Niger Republic. So when all these issues, uh, Senator, was happening in the north and all that, uh, Maradi is like my home base. And so, but I know that they don't have electricity there. And that's why the bank launched a $20 billion investment program to develop 10,000 megawatts of electricity all across the Sahel countries, including northern Nigeria, by the way, that will provide electricity for 250 million people. And when done, it will be the largest solar zone in the world. We've started in Burkina Faso. We've started in Chad. We started in Mali, and will continue as soon as things uh, 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 allow us to do so. Now, let me ask you just a question here about what you know about energy. Anybody know anything called Inga? Have you ever heard it, of it? Okay. 
you haven't heard about Inga. Okay. You should. Because Inga is the largest source of hydropower that Africa has. 44,000 megawatts potential in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But ever since I was in university, I've been hearing about Inga. So I went over there to see President Chisekedi, and they took me to the site of Inga. And I asked them, why is this vast potential not being used? And they gave me all kinds of reasons. Then I got to the community where Inga was based, so I asked the population, can you tell me what the name Inga means? You know what they told me? They said the name Inga means yes. Yes, Y-E-S. So on my way out, they gave me the golden book to sign. And I put there, the African Development Bank says yes. Because with 44,000 megawatts of solar, we can actually, they can be exporting power to Nigeria, to South Africa, to all of that. Why are we suffering in the middle of so much wealth? Yes, 100% electricity is the only thing that is acceptable and is the thing that we must achieve as a continent. Your Excellences, ladies and gentlemen. Africa will gain respect when it can secure the health of its own people. When COVID struck, Africa was caught unprepared due to several decades of underinvestment in health and the development of the pharmaceutical industry. You know, I should tell you, when I was, uh, when I was a student um, in the University of Ife, um, you know, my, my professor who taught me about chemistry is sitting right in front of you here. Uh, uh, Prof, can you stand up, please? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor Molly taught me biochemistry. Never met a man more brilliant. He used to show up with no notes, and all those benzene rings and stuff like that, he grew them right into our brain. And I can never forget that his passion for biochemistry stays with me till today. You are a great man. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But today, Africa produces 20 to 30 percent of its pharmaceutical products, 1 percent of its vaccines. And so when this issue of COVID started, it was for me very heart-wrenching to see African leaders going all over the world trying to find basic things, medicines, gloves, sanitizers, and masks. We were at the bottom of the value chain. And I said to myself, my staff are here, never again. To reverse that situation, the African Development Bank put up a $10 billion emergency facility. That facility allowed our countries to quickly recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 and allowed them to have access to all of this sanitizers, and masks, and, and, and the oxygen, all the things that they needed. Now, how in the world did we come to a place where we externalized the health of our population? Where we then dependent, became dependent for 1.4 billion people's health on the benevolence of others? Now, what if others are not so benevolent? Now, what will happen? And therefore, we must manufacture more of our medications. When I was growing up in Nigeria, we used to have something called BOD products. I don't, yeah. We used to have all these good pharmaceutical companies here. But they are gone now. In fact, to manufacture these vaccines, you now need technologies and processes that are protected by intellectual property rights under the World Trade Organization. So you cannot actually have access to that. And so we decided as a bank to change that in three ways. First, we started investing $3 billion to revamp all the pharmaceutical plants in Nigeria, I mean in Africa, including in Nigeria. We also have committed $3 billion to revamping the healthcare infrastructure in Africa. You know, if you get primary health care right, 85% of all of the problems are solved. 
but 50% of them have no access to electricity. Only 30% of them have access to water and sanitation. And so we decided that we'll invest $3 billion in revamping all this infrastructure for all our primary, secondary, and tertiary health care facilities. But when it comes to the issue of vaccines, if you look at what has happened since COVID, a number of companies, global pharma companies, have come to Africa to set up manufacturing companies, which is good. However, they are fill and finish companies. In other words, you, you fill it, you package it, and then you sell it. It's like selling Coca-Cola, right? But Coca-Cola, you may like drinking it like I do, at least I used to. Now until my wife started telling me I was getting weight. But you cannot change the formulation because Africa's own epidemiological profile is very different. And therefore, we must have the scientific capacity, the innovative capacity, to be able to manufacture vaccines and pharmaceutical drugs that deals with our own epidemiological profile. And I was at the, in Belgium, when all African heads of state were there with all European heads of state. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Charles Michel, who is the chief president of the European Union Council, said, is there anybody that has a burning issue on their mind? Of course, my job, my duty, my calling, my responsibility is to be a vuvuzela for Africa's needs. When I put up my hand, I say, Your Excellency, I've got something on my mind. And what I, want on my, what I have on my mind is how are we going to make sure that African companies, pharmaceutical companies, can have access to the active pharmaceutical ingredients that they need, to the antigens that they need to manufacture vaccines. How in the world are we going to be able to do that? I can see. So we decided, and I said, let's create what's called the Africa Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation that will intermediate between our local companies and the global pharma companies in access to intellectual property rights protected technologies and processes for making pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines. I am glad to let you know that our foundation is now up and running. The office will be opened in Kigali next month on the 18th of December. I was able to get His Excellency President Kagame to chair the council of that foundation. And a very good friend of mine, Chancellor Merkel, the former Chancellor of, the, of, of Germany, I went to see her too because she's been really a great supporter of Africa. And she said, look, Akin, I've, I've retired. And I'm not seeing anybody else. I'm writing my memoirs. But you, I will see. <laughs> and I went over there. And she accepted to be the co-chair of that Africa Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation. And that's because we lose $2.6 to low productivity and health in Africa. Trillion dollars, $2.6 trillion. So a healthier Africa would definitely be a much richer Africa. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Africa will earn respect when it deepens good governance and the rule of law. Ah, you can clap better than that. For now, the erosion of the democratic space in several African countries is disturbing. The Mo Ibrahim Governance Index declined in 2022 and 2023. The return and the rise in the number of military coups in parts of Africa, especially the Sahel, poses a potent and imminent danger to reversing the continent's stability, growth, and development. Now, fixing this, because I lived there, I walked in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, everywhere, for many, many years. I know those places like the back of my hand. Requires a clear understanding that the Sahel region has continued to suffer for decades from climate change, desertification, and extreme poverty, and more recently from terrorism. Terrorists, ladies and gentlemen, don't just appear. They don't just appear. High youth unemployment 
and climate and environmental degradation, what I call the disaster triangle. Anywhere you find this disaster triangle, be it in the Horn of Africa, be it in the Sahel, terrorists, or in northern Nigeria, terrorists take over this place. Today, many of our countries are spending upward of 85% of their budgets on security. What's left? For development. And therefore, we must urgently and comprehensively tackle this challenge to prevent reversals of gains in development. This calls for strengthening of the overall security architecture. You know, let me just explain it so I don't get too technical. When countries don't have money to support themselves in the fiscal space that's very tight, they need new instruments. And I remember saying, as a president of a multilateral development bank, our job is to finance development. But here's the challenge today. 85% of Africans are living in or close to a country that is in conflict. And therefore, when I talk about we are financing development, we must be able to change our perspective to link security to investment, to growth and development. It's an ecosystem that we must have new instruments that allow us to do that. And that's why I made the case to African heads of state that we will help to develop what is called security index investment bonds. These are new financial instruments that will allow African countries to access significant amount of resources on the global capital market to do four things for them. First, strengthen your security defense architecture. I'm not saying guns. We don't sponsor guns. We don't do, don't do uh, bullets. No. But just your security capacity. Second. Rebuild areas that have damaged infrastructure. Third, build social infrastructure. Water, education, health, schools. And the reason why this is important is because when terrorists come to a place and they look like ungoverned spaces and forgotten spaces, they thrive in those environments. And finally, you go to Saudi Arabia and try to attack their oil fields. You can't. You go to Qatar and try to attack their gas fields, you can't. When the African Development Bank put together during the Africa Investment Forum a transaction worth $24 billion for Mozambique, liquefied natural gas, the largest foreign direct investment in Africa. Shortly after that, terrorists took over Cabo Delgado of $24 billion investment. No. That can happen in Saudi Arabia. That can happen in Qatar. That can happen anywhere. So the point I'm making is these new instruments will allow our countries to secure the zones in which they have strategic investments. And that is very, very important. Coming right back at home. Two weeks ago, I met with the seven governors from the northwest of Nigeria. They came to see me in Abidjan. We discussed the challenges in northern Nigeria, northwest Nigeria. Today, with terrorism, poverty, unemployment problems. It is loud and it is correct, but it will only be respected when Africa's problems are financed by Africa's resources. Political sovereignty must be backed by economic and financial sovereignty. Africa will earn more respect when it can mobilize financing for its own development levels. Several countries rush to the capital markets to source cheaper loans to develop their economies, especially to invest in critical infrastructure. The number of companies that countries that went to Eurobonds went for two to 21 between 2007 and 2022. They issued 140 billion dollars of Eurobonds. Many of them went to China to get a lot more, but it's pay time now, and it's very difficult for many African countries. It's spent to service debt. Africa must find a better, a more sustainable way to finance its development. We can do that if we manage our natural resources well. That's because the value of our natural resources is $6.2 trillion. We have no business not being able to finance our own development. Africa should not be a poor continent. 
It's high time for Africa, therefore, to truly assert its aspiration and move up from being a low-income, highly indebted nation, set of nations and become a donor to less privileged nations. Global respect comes when nations do not overly depend on others. What do you see? You see country A, Africa summit. Country B, with Africa summit. Country C, with Africa summit. Why? Africa is a continent. It should be the other way, where Africa brings those countries here to have a summit with Africa here. Not that we are traveling around the world at the beck of a single person. That should not be. You don't get respect that way. Africa, if we can dream it, we can achieve it. Africa will earn respect, ladies and gentlemen, when its youth can be taken care of by Africa and we can unleash the potential of our young people. Let me tell you a story. Just before I was elected president, I mean, a week after I was elected president of the bank, I went to a place called Gore Island in Senegal. Gore Island is a place where you have a door, a big door, they call it the door of no return. That's where they took all the slaves. And I stood over there in this place of the door of no return. And my mind was working about visions of those that they, were, they took out of this place. And when I got him back to my car, I began to reflect because I had a week to resume work. And I said to myself, thought to myself, those people they took out of these places were taken away against their volition. Today, young generations, Africa's best and brightest, strongest, are taking rickety boats with their own volition, heading into the Mediterranean Sea, many dying over there. This shouldn't be. We have a population of 477 million people between the ages of 15 and 35. We must harness that asset. We must. I picked up the paper, New York Times, that talks about the fact that the world is becoming more African. That's because the demography is changing. Most of it are going to be a lot of our young people. But I want to say that as we try to create more jobs for our people, for our young people, we have to realize that they are very talented. They don't need handouts. They need investment. I go around African countries. Many tell me, Mr. President, we have a youth empowerment program. We have another youth empowerment program. But unfortunately, I've never had a young person walk up to me to say, I've been empowered. So I assume that those that are doing it are probably empowering themselves. And so I don't believe in all this youth empowerment business. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the youth shouldn't be lifted up. No, that's not what I'm saying. The youths don't need dole outs, they don't need handouts. They need strategic investments in their skills, their knowledge, their entrepreneurship capacity, in their businesses. We must create youth based wealth. That's all we've got to do as a continent. And that is why at the African Development Bank, we're launching what's called Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks. Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks are new financial institutions that will do nothing but finance the businesses, the ideas, the enterprises of young people. They are going to be forced rate banks because they will finance those businesses in the life cycle of their businesses. These young people are going to dominate the world. Look at Nollywood. In fact, when I used to work at Rockefeller Foundation in the 90s, I was in Zimbabwe. And I entered my office. My staff was Julie, my secretary. And as I entered, it was about 1999, I think. And she said, good morning, sir. And I said, good morning. She said, Psst. So I said, what was that? She said, I said, what happened? She said, sir, that's what they do in Nollywood. <laughs> I said, at that time, I didn't even realize that Nollywood had become something ex exported like that. I said, okay, Nollywood is good, but not that part of it. 
So we, in Nigeria, we launched something called IDIS, Digital Information and Creative Enterprises, $614 million that will allow the creation of 6 million jobs in Nigeria, digital and creative enterprises that will add $6.4 billion to Nigeria's economy. As I close, let me say that there is no doubt in my mind that the future for Africa is bright. And investors know it. Two weeks ago, we had the Africa Investment Forum in the city of Marrakesh in Morocco. We had about 1,000 people, investors from around the world that were there. We raised $34.8 billion of investment for Africa in less than 72 hours. And since we started it in five years ago, four years ago, actually 19, 2018, so four year, five years ago, right now, we have helped to mobilize $177 billion of investment interest to Africa. That just tells you that Africa is bankable. Right here in Nigeria, look at what Dangote is doing. Phenomenal. I think we should clap for Dangote. I like people that have confidence in their own countries. We put in $400 million to support that. We put in another $400 million to support Indorama that is doing fertilizers in Nigeria. We put well over $200 million to support Bua, who is doing uh, 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 cement in the northwest of Nigeria. And in Nigeria, to date, the African Development Bank has put in 10 billion US dollars. And please do tell President Tinubu that the African Development Bank strongly would back Nigeria and the reforms of Nigeria because in those reforms lies our pathway out of the morass we are in today. So we see huge opportunities in Nigeria and we believe in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, excellences, I am optimistic about Nigeria. I've always said this. God does not make mistakes. I was born as a Nigerian. I'll live as a Nigerian. I'll die as a Nigerian. And on the resurrection day, I'll ask God for permission to let me hold a green, white, green flag in my hand. I'm optimistic about Africa, and I believe in Africa. The African Development Bank itself, which is your bank, it's a great honor for me to be the first Nigerian ever to be president of the African Development Bank since 1964. And I thank God that last year, the African Development Bank was ranked as the best multilateral financial institution in the world. And this year, the African Development Bank was ranked as the most transparent financial institution in the world. That's a testimony of how you get respect and how you get recognition. All comes from doing the right things. So we now stand, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at an intersection point in world history. Let's bring Africa's prosperous future into the present. A more prosperous Africa will be a more respected Africa. An Africa that unleashes its full potential. An Africa like a lighthouse at the harbor that will attract all ships to it. An Africa that cannot be ignored. An Africa that develops with pride. An Africa that asserts itself globally. An Africa that's a beacon of hope for all of his people. Together, let's be guardians of that hope for Africa. Together, we can make it happen. Thank you very much, and God bless you all.